Welcome to the Starship Vlog 001 for January 15th, 2013, the NRC's report on NASA's strategic direction. I'm Buck Field. The National Research Council has released a public draft of a great report titled NASA's Strategic Direction and the Need for a National Consensus. Since NASA will undoubtedly be involved in future Starship development, its strategic planning is important to interstellar flight and Starship development. Because it is so well known as an organization, it's a great resource for communicating real-world examples of success and failure and principles behind them, at least for audiences likely to be watching, those interested in project management and or Starships. The National Research Council Council report that just came out regarding NASA is 81 pages split into two parts. Part one is called NASA's past and current trajectory. Trajectory. Very punny. This section starts with the organization's creation in 1958 and finishes with interviews the team conducted last year. Analysis of NASA's latest strategic plan, published in 2011, revealed that NASA has no clear guidelines or priorities for allocating resources. That got my attention because resource allocation under conditions of uncertainty was a key focus for some post-grad work I did at University of Texas at Dallas. I've never imagined chaotic situations like checkout lines or traffic could be modeled, enabling us to see the effects of redesigning grocery stores, layout, or the timing of traffic lights. NASA's resource allocation should be understood deeply. It should be clearly planned and explicitly justified for lots of reasons. But perhaps most valuable among these is so that when conditions change, change, resource allocations can be adjusted effectively, and progress based on well-defined, planned priorities can be maintained. NASA doesn't have any of these capabilities. In planning and development for almost a year, the NRC report addresses this. Along with that, most of its other conclusions took me about an hour and a half on my own, just reading the 2011 NASA strategy, and then extrapolating what conditions would lead to a document so vague it's pretty much worthless. As discussed last time, if you're spending a million bucks, you better use language like a doctor. Or as the NRC would say, the strategic plan as formulated does not provide sufficient clarity or the guidance that NASA will require as the agency deals with the technical, programmatic, and budgetary challenges that are likely in the next 10 to 50 years. The report points out that a planned mission to an asteroid is not widely accepted as a compelling destination. To which I'd say visiting an asteroid is less exciting than going to Cleveland in February. So sending humans to a destination like that had better have a very good justification. Exciting asteroid discoveries are already being made now without worrying about people dying on missions or getting leukemia from radiation in 20 years. There's even a new report just out that claims to have established Alzheimer's as another risk from space radiation. Humans would be fried at a fraction of the time the Dawn spacecraft will be working and the cost to send humans is not anywhere near comparable. One thing I didn't understand was was this report's recommendation to measure NASA's budgeting against what is called non-defense spending. People are working on the behalf of our entire species, future generations, to expand the universe, explore, answer deep questions, and investigate the universe. These NASA researchers would be begging on street corners with their hats in hand, except for one thing. They're not legally allowed to campaign directly for more funding. If you're watching this, you're probably interested in exploration, science, space, and when we see resources being devoted to war profits on one hand with education and exploration of space being strangled with the other, ignoring that contrast hardly seems appropriate. Absent sufficient justification, I think the NRC recommendation to downplay this dichotomy is a mistake, and I don't think this report has many of those. NASA's audacious successes in the past established the U.S. as a bold leader to be admired and emulated. Now, the mealy-mouthed market speak on full display in NASA's 2011 strategic plan is like the ads manipulating people to run up their credit card debt. They're designed not to offend anyone by vaguely pandering to positive emotions. This, with unreliable shoestring funding, leaves international partners we need with the sense that NASA itself is unreliable, which is not true, and it's flailing, which is true. This reminds me of a scene from last year's remake of Judge Dredd, where NASA is drugged with confused missions from changing administrations, then tossed off a balcony in slow motion by long-term congressional underfunding. This NRC report 
report is clear. NASA needs reliable funding to develop and implement effective strategic goals. And it points out that NASA's goals are set by the White House and Congress on behalf of the American people. You will be shocked to learn neither the White House nor Congress seems to be doing an especially effective job on our behalf in this area. The report recommends leadership, stating that strategic goals and objectives should be ambitious, yet technically rational, and should focus on the long term. Soon, extrasolar Earth-like planets are going to be identified, and then we will start detecting water, then chlorophyll. Then we'll realize we had signs of other similar compounds to chlorophyll at the base of new ecosystems, but because we'd never encountered them or studied them, it didn't occur to us for, to look for those signatures in the data. The point is that there will soon be areas to explore greater than any in our history, and developing our exploration capability to meet this situation within sensible constraints must be one of NASA's strategic goals. Because of the distances, human interstellar travel will be unachievable with the duration, costs, and risks inherent in relativistic exploration. Faster than light technology will be required. Such technology can only be developed from enabling physics models with proven functionality. Conceptually speaking, we just need to bang the right representational rocks together in the near term. And the killer is that this kind of work is the least expensive we could ever hope for. Producing a hundred candidate physics models, even if they all totally failed, wouldn't require us to construct a single building, enlarge a single data center, or burn $81,000 per second launching a rocket. Theoretical research is like project planning. It has the highest return on investment of any activity. What we need is an official establishment of the goal and perseverance to commit the resources necessary to following tried and true methods for success. While that may sound great, does including this sort of Starship research help meet NASA's needs now for a good long-term strategy according to the National Research Council's report? It, the report presents six things to consider. Benefit, integration, excellence, and innovation counts that as one, credibility, global perspective, and interagency collaboration. Faster than light research and development offers spectacular opportunities in all of these. And as we've discussed before, we can identify logical near-term stepping stones to reach the goal. First, benefits. Arguments in favor of benefits for interstellar flight often include the lifeboat argument, that we need a place to which we can escape when the next big asteroid hits and wipes out our chances for survival. We don't know when this will happen. I don't think it's it's a particularly inspirational justification, but starships are the answer for those who find this inevitable danger compelling. I suspect the faster we develop starship technology, the more likely we will be able to detect and avoid this risk by doing something with the asteroid. And I like that justification a lot more. For me though, the main benefit is emotional and intangible. I can't think of anything grander, more noble, and deeply inspiring than helping the future generations reach and dwell in the heavens. Like hundreds of thousands who worked on the pyramids and cathedrals in the past, dedicating our lives to reaching the stars offers us the satisfaction of living for a greater purpose than mere survival or enriching ourselves. It gives us the opportunity to make our world a better place because of what we do and provides a living cultural tradition and virtue we can pass on to our grandchildren. Finally, there are the practical benefits that would flow from fundamental advances in science, perhaps even more revolutionary than fire. And I I don't think that's an exaggeration. Faster than light will almost certainly require us to understand why we see space and distance the way we do. These revolutionary models will explain phenomena like entanglement, where we see two separate objects, but we know it is really just one. Like heliocentrism explained why we see the sun move around the earth when it really doesn't, and just like evolution explained why we see separate species when they are really aren't, and just like all revolutionary models, the key in work enabling models will primarily be that they expose a critical factor about our perception which we never considered before. The beneficial impacts of gaining these insights into reality are likely to be incalculable, reaching far beyond interstellar flight. Next is integration. How different portfolios, programs, and projects work together and support each other within a strategic goal. Human operations and exploration is obviously the most naturally associated program area at NASA for Star 
leadership development and coordinating the strategy. Earth and space science build our understanding and capabilities for in-system activities when we reach other potentially habitable planets' systems. NASA's Earth Science Program is needed for us to understand Earth-like exoplanets we encounter, their interiors, lands, oceans, biology, and atmospheres. Planetary science helps us understand what we are looking at when conditions are substantially different from those of Earth, especially when those differences might be so great that we look at a thriving ecosystem and not even know it. Heliophysics are similarly important for the space environment and space weather surrounding Earth and Earth-like exoplanets. We need to understand coronal mass ejections, radiation bursts, magnetic storms, stellar winds, etc. What risks they pose and what actions we can take in order to respond. Astronomy most obviously has the primary role in identifying target destinations. Astrophysics seems largely ignored in the NRC report, but it is where initial work on developing new cosmological models is most appropriately based and should be the hub for developing the new Copernican models at NASA. NASA teams will be at the heart of conceptualizing the first candidate models and creating the tests that would disprove or confirm potential warp enabling models. Aeronautics is the key research foundation not only for getting around here on Earth, but getting to the surface of an exoplanet from space, traveling around its surface at close range, and returning to orbit. Space technology is where the nuts and bolts of the starship itself will be imagined, planned, and where the dream is made into a concrete reality. These are all the program areas, so we can say the starship goal directly meets the benefit acceptance criteria for all NASA program areas, and if we had the time, we could devote an entire episode to each program area, showing how and estimating to what degree the NRC's acceptance criteria would be met by the faster than light Starship goal. Instead, we'll try a quick overview. Excellence and innovation is next, and we've covered innovation as a benefit, but not so much excellence on its own. Fortunately, excellence is part of NASA's organizational DNA and history, even when the excellent work is performed for badly selected goals. NASA and its people must be allowed to have goals worthy of a great organization, great international partnerships, and leading toward achieving compelling visions. The Starship goal can provide this. Credibility requires official widespread commitment as mentioned before. One reason for this is that absent a real need to change direction, proposals that threaten the status quo in unacceptable ways are opposed not merely by authorities who get accused of having a conspiracy to suppress innovation, but rather it is the structure of the organization itself which is problematic. Take the National Science Foundation. The NSF identifies transdisciplinary research as especially high value. This is not entirely consistent with history and philosophy of science, but it is what we've got. NSF procedures route proposals to be handled by the directorate with the majority responsibility for the proposed research overall. The NSF has, surprisingly enough, three major disciplinary categories. You can pretty much take all of the work that NSF founds and you can call it environmental and life sciences, or physical sciences and engineering, or social science. In fact, all of the NSF work is categorized by these areas. If topology, algorithms, physics, philosophy of science, and project management are all equal, there is no majority. The NSF system can't digest it. Another example is the Department of Energy. Internet and the global position satellite system. Those were truly game changers in the way information is generated throughout the world. You need to do the same for energy. Department of Energy, which handles advanced nuclear physics and fundamental research. Yet there's a fundamental question related to energy that they do not have any way to even try to answer. That question is, what exactly is energy? They don't want to know. It's not a priority. These illustrate why senior leadership, who are both above organizational structure and outside the operational and cognitive constraints, are needed for fundamental change. White House and Congressional endorsement of NASA and its strategic goal of interstellar flight will undoubtedly take public pressure and endorsement of many experts and influential parties for that to happen. The NRC report recommends the United States should explore opportunities to lead a more international approach to future large space efforts, both in the space program and the science program. Starship development is such an opportunity. It will have to be international, it's big, has universal appeal, and is an inspiring goal like the pyramids and cathedrals of the past. It is not a quick fix solution to anything. 
planet. And the fact that Starship development isn't going to be completed in the lifespan of any of the people who start it doesn't make it less inspiring. It makes it more emotionally powerful. Our most powerful and inspiring stories are tales of dedicating one's life to the benefit of others. That's it for this week. Here's our Starship pop culture from 1951's The Day the Earth Stood Still. Thanks for watching. Research is like project planning. Theoretical research is like project planning.